I almost forgot to start recording. Woo! That would have been fun. Discover that 45 minutes down the line. In 1918, children read for the first time how a loose-jointed 50-year-old rag doll was dragged down from the attic by a little girl named Marcella. Her grandmother, overjoyed by seeing the doll again, cleaned up its blue dress and white apron, sewed on new shoe-button eyes to replace the ones it had lost, tousled its red yarn hair, and, while replacing its well-worn stuffing, gave it a brand new candy heart. A bright red one with the words, I love you, painted on it in blue. Having restored some of its former glory and giving it a heart that could only know love, she turned the doll over to Marcella, and Marcella raced home to introduce Raggedy Ann to her new doll family. The tin soldier, the French dolly, the Indian doll, and the Dutch doll who says mama when she is tipped backward and forward. 1919 saw Raggedy Ann's world expand with the introduction of her long-lost brother, Raggedy Andy. Andy had the same face as Ann, the same red yarn hair, and the same love of adventure and devotion to his doll family, even if he did not have a candy heart of his own. In the course of 51 books and stories published by Ann and Andy's original creator, their little family would gradually fill out Little Marcella's room with a veritable toy store's worth of characters. Raggedy Dog, the Camel with the Wrinkled Knees, Sunny Bunny, Bubbles the Clown, and Sam Lamb among them. And also a few that haven't aged well because, um, this was also the age of the minstrel show. So, yeah. With such a colorful cast of friendly, loving characters, it might seem strange to some to learn that in the 1970s, the duo of ragdolls would front a dark, surrealistic adventure on the silver screen that would see them facing down dictators, monsters, and an honest-to-God literal war. But, as out of character as it might seem at first, it's just another chapter in the life of the ragdolly with the candy heart. Born in 1880 in Arcola, Illinois, USA, as the son of Hoosier Group Impressionist painter Richard Buckner Gruel, John Barton Gruel's family moved to Indianapolis, Indiana when he was only two. Richard, a former house and sign painter who had taught himself Impressionism and had then become popular and influential in the Hoosier art circles, provided a home for his son Johnny that was always filled with artists and writers. Johnny would grow up surrounded by family friends such as painters William Forsyth and T.C. Steele, as well as poet James Whitcomb Riley, whose poem The Elf Child would later inspire the comic strip character Little Orphan Annie. Johnny would become fascinated with art, and his father would tutor him in drawing while his younger sister Prudence would study music, going on to tour the vaudeville circuit as a singer, and his younger brother Justin would also study art and become a landscape painter and muralist. In 1901, Gruel, by then already submitting political cartoons and single-frame sports comics for the local newspapers at the ripe old age of 19, would marry Myrtle J. Swan. Just a year later, they would have the first of their three children, a daughter named Marcella. The family would move from Indianapolis to Cleveland, Ohio just shortly after, and again in 1910 to the Norwalk, Connecticut area, where Johnny would continue his illustration career while also living on and helping to manage a 16-acre property in Silvermine that his parents had recently acquired. Johnny's artwork would be made in a studio that he shared with his father and brother, and it was during this time period that he would win a New York Herald comic contest, taking both first and second prizes and securing a syndication deal for his own comic strip, Mr. Twee Deedle, which would publish in national syndication until 1918. In 1914, his comic strips caught the eyes of children's publishers, 
and he started receiving commissions to illustrate volumes of fairy tales. In 1915, Gruel's daughter Marcella passed away suddenly from an infected smallpox vaccination. In the same year, Gruel would be awarded U.S. Patent Number D-47,789, a design pattern for a prototype rag doll. To name the doll, Johnny Gruel combined two of his family friend James Whitcomb Riley's most famous poems, The Raggedy Man and The Elf Child, which by that point had been republished under the new title, Little Orphant Annie, and he came up with Raggedy Ann. Gruel's family would begin making and selling Raggedy Ann dolls in their home in Norwalk, Connecticut, and he would write and illustrate the first book of Raggedy Ann's stories, naming Ann's owner, Marcella. The book would be published by the P.F. Volland Company, who had already been hiring Gruel to illustrate some of their books from other authors. Before long, P.F. Volland took over responsibility for manufacturing the dolls as well, and began to package them with the book, which quickly became a sales phenomenon. Over the course of the rest of his life, Gruel would keep up a steady pace of artistic work, producing not only the increasingly popular Raggedy Ann and Andy stories, at least one story a year, and frequently an entire book of stories, but also more illustrated volumes of fairy tales, additional non-Raggedy Ann books of his own, and cartoon work for national newspapers, including a second syndicated strip, Brutus, which would run until 1938. In 1932, with Brutus already running in syndication and the original Raggedy Ann stories having sold almost two million copies, Gruel and his family moved to Miami, Florida. Shortly after the move, Raggedy Ann's publisher, P.F. Volland, went bankrupt right in the middle of the Great Depression, and another doll company, Molly E.'s Doll Outfitters, suddenly started to produce unauthorized Raggedy Ann and Andy dolls. The Gruel family would sue for patent infringement, and the case would drag on for years, with Molly E.'s founder, Molly Goldman, showing in her own defense that Gruel had never patented or trademarked Raggedy Andy, and that she had been awarded a design patent of her own for the male character. The case of Gruel versus Goldman would initially be decided in favor of Goldman, but Gruel would ultimately win on appeal in 1937, with Molly E.'s doll outfitters ordered to immediately cease production of their dolls. In 1938, Gruel, who had been suffering from a variety of ailments his doctors believed to be caused by extreme levels of stress, died unexpectedly of heart failure at the age of 56. His widow Myrtle would take over the day-to-day -day business of the Johnny Gruel Company, filling in the blanks in their legal rights by filing any and all trademarks and patents that her husband had never taken care of himself, just to avoid any more legal cases like the one he had spent the last few years of his life fighting. The Johnny Gruel Company would promote Gruel's extensive body of work and eventually would secure a new home for Raggedy Ann and Andy at the Bob's Merrill Company. A host of illustrators would list Gruel as chief among their inspirations for their own work, including Mary Engelbright and none other than Dr. Zeus. Bob's Merrill would ultimately become a part of Simon & Schuster Publishing, who still holds the media trademarks to Raggedy Ann and Andy to this day while Bob's Merrill's partner in toy manufacturing, the Knickerbocker Toy Company, would be acquired by Hasbro, who hold the trademarks on Raggedy Ann and Andy dolls. In many ways, Raggedy Ann and Andy are the first true cross-media promotional blockbuster and one of the longest lasting. I'll tell you something, I'm getting pretty sick and tired of all the dumb things that go on around here. This is no place for a strong, tough, and terrific boy like myself. The exact inspiration of Raggedy Ann is not known, although there are numerous legends around it. That's in part thanks to Johnny Gruel himself, who seemed to delight in changing the story behind his decision to write the character throughout his career. One of the most popular stories is that Raggedy Ann herself was created in tribute to Johnny Gruel's daughter Marcella after her death, 
but the original patent filing for the doll happened months before her tragic passing, casting doubt on that particular story. The Bob's Merrill Company, which had started publishing Raggedy Ann and Andy in the 1960s, became interested in moving the characters into animation. It wouldn't be the first time the character had been used in cartoons, as Raggedy Ann and Andy had appeared in an animated short all the way back in 1941. But the duo had been out of the cartoon industry for a while when Bob's Merrill approached Richard Williams about the idea. Today, Williams is popular among animation enthusiasts for his great unfinished work, The Thief and the Cobbler, as well as his pioneering work on Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But at the time, he was already popular in Hollywood, with his work on animated title sequences for films like What's New Pussycat, 1967's Casino Royale, and If Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. He had also started building a legacy in short subjects, including 1971's animated A Christmas Carol, in which Alastair Sim had returned to the role of Ebenezer Scrooge, a short for which Williams would win the Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film. Williams was familiar with the characters and agreed to produce the film with former Warner Brothers, UPA, and MGM animation director Abe Levitow helming the project. The entire package was taken to Universal Pictures, who turned it down. Then it was taken to Warner Brothers, who turned it down. The third time would be a charm when Williams approached 20th Century Fox, who agreed to finance and distribute the film. A script was worked up by writers Max Wilk, who had been kicking around the world of television variety and thriller shows since 1949's The Ford Theater Hour, and Patricia Thackray, whose only prior produced credit on television was 1969's The Littlest Angel for the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Their script was inspired by Johnny Gruel's 1924 book, Raggedy Ann and Andy and the Camel with the Wrinkled Knees, but with significant liberties taken. Hey, hey this is real sticky. Mmm, it's real delicious, too. The movie was well into pre-production in 1975 when Abe Levitow suddenly passed away from a bone tumor. With the director gone, Richard Williams wanted to find a replacement with a similar pedigree from the major animation studios, but the financiers were adamant that they would accept only one possible replacement, Richard Williams himself. Williams was reluctantly thrust into the director's chair, and immediately he started voicing concerns about the script. In particular, he was reportedly very concerned about the massive quantity of musical numbers from Sesame Street songwriter Joe Raposo that had been written into the screenplay, fearing that so much time would be spent on the songs that Raggedy Ann and Andy would come across as underdeveloped, underdefined characters. But again, the financiers, who by now included not only 20th Century Fox, but also the International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation, flexed their muscles and demanded that the script continue into production without any edits to the scenes or the songs. Character designs were underway and the screenplay was locked. The cast was quickly filled out with popular radio comics and cartoon voice actors, including Arnold Stang, Joe Silver, Marty Brill, and Alan Swift, who you can hear more about in the Film Optimist's Dracula No. 11 video, Always Be Plugging. Fox wanted a star for the lead role, however. Raggedy Ann had to be a name with drawing power. Liza Minnelli was considered, but her voice was deemed too aggressive. Goldie Hawn, fresh off of a successful run of movies including There's a Girl in My Soup, Butterflies Are Free, and Shampoo, was reportedly also in the running, as was Tammy Grimes, whose signature raspy voice had long been featured on television guest roles, as well as in her own series, The Tammy Grimes Show, which had only lasted for four aired episodes. None of these actresses would wind up taking the starring role. Instead, there was one actress who, in audition, blew the casting team away. 
She was a young, rising star, still three years away from her breakout role, but once the producers heard the distinctive speaking and singing voice of Dee Dee Khan, there was nobody else they could imagine as Raggedy Ann. My name is Raggedy Ann, and this is my brother, Raggedy Andy. Well, am I? You're in the playroom, that's where. You'll probably love it. Oh, la, 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 la. What am I doing in such a terrible place? Oh, nice. But there you're going to love it here with us. In recording sessions, Richard Williams encouraged the actors to play fast and loose with the script. This would make the task of audio editing harder in the long run, but it gave him more to play with in defining the characters. But perhaps the biggest thing affecting the vocals was a health problem. When she arrived to record her lines and songs as Raggedy Ann, Dee Dee Khan was suffering from a bout of laryngitis that caused her voice to sound rough, whispery, and a little bit pained. It would have been completely understandable to delay her recording sessions, but Williams decided that Khan's unique vocal style, heard through the filter of a case of laryngitis, was exactly what he was looking for, saying that it gave her songs a plaintive quality. Khan would never be happy with her performance of the songs, in particular the song Home, but Williams considered that number to be his favorite song out of the bunch. With vocal tracks and songs laid down, animation began in earnest. There was no centralized animation studio where everybody was working. In the mid-1970s, an era before cellular phones and the internet, the entire animation team was working remotely. Among the team were fresh-faced new animators, working alongside old hands at the craft, like Art Babbitt, who had designed Goofy for Walt Disney, and Grim Natwick, who had created the original Betty Boop design for Fleischer Studios. Also working behind the ink and paint was Tissa David, the Romanian-born animator who, while living in France, had become only the second woman in the history of film to direct an animated feature with Bonjour Paris, and whose work as the primary artist for the character of Raggedy Ann would make her the first woman to animate a major film character. In an interview with the New York Times, Tissa David would say about her work on the movie, Perhaps I will prove a point. To create a female character in an animated film, you must think like a woman and feel like a woman. In other words, you must be a woman. Now, get your things, dear. We're going home. Just one moment, you rebel rabble. I am not going anywhere except Paris. Oh, where's the captain? I am the captain now. Well, where's the captain? Captain? The movie was intended for a holiday release in 1976, a grueling but manageable schedule. Fox promoted the movie not just with the standard advertisements, but also with a float in the 1976 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, where professional singers and dancers dressed as the characters from the movie sang the musical number Rag Dolly for the televised broadcast. However, by the time the float was rolling down the street, it was already apparent that the film wasn't going to make its release date. The complexity of the animation was causing the project to drift over budget on both money and time. Not the first such incident in Richard Williams' career, and also not the last. Williams was often thought of as an animator's animator and a true perfectionist. Even in a case like Raggedy Ann and Andy, where he had accepted the job reluctantly, he was determined to make it the best movie that he could. Deadlines started to be missed, and the financiers started to worry that the movie was going to take too long to complete. Cuts had to be made, starting with Richard Williams. Williams may still be credited as the director on the film, but the financiers had booted him from production in the final months. The movie was taken out of his hands, and re-edited with segments that he had thought of as incomplete being used in the final cut. In addition, the decision was made to further edit some scenes, in the process cutting some parts of the film that hadn't been fully animated yet so that the project could finish faster. The Leica reel for the movie, a 
precursor to what today's animators and filmmakers would call an animatic, predicted that the movie would be 108 minutes long. The finished movie clocked in at a lean and trim 84 minutes. The movie did not release anywhere close to 1976's holiday season, but it did make it into cinemas on April the 1st, 1977. Finally released into the world, Raggedy Ann and Andy, A Musical Adventure, was not treated kindly by the critics. In line with Williams' own concerns about the script he had been required to work with, they complained that the movie was too slowly paced, with many critics laying the blame at the near wall-to-wall -wall musical numbers. Others complained that the characters of Raggedy Ann and Andy were so poorly developed that it was hard to tell if they were brother and sister or boyfriend and girlfriend. That was actually pretty common for the duo. In 1941, the animated short they appeared in depicted them as a romantic couple, even though the source book said they were siblings, and readers of the books over the years had said that the way the two spoke lovingly of each other sometimes made their relationship seem confused as well. Although that's actually perfect if you think of these two characters as dolls held in the hands of a young child. All right, you two. So, you're best friends. No, wait. You're actually enemies. The secret wedding is our wedding. We are to be wed today at the secret wedding. Rebecca! Kiss. That was more fun than I should have had doing that, but let's go. But probably the most common complaint was that the movie was very, very dark with a lot of adult moments. From Captain Contagious's very adult gyrations upon seeing Babette for the first time, to the surrealistic nightmare of the greedy, who wants to rip out and eat Raggedy Ann's candy heart, nightmare fuel abounds throughout the entire movie. And critics weren't sure what all of this terror was doing in a children's show. Well, I want that sweet candy heart. It's her heart now, but soon it will be mine. Let's take a moment to consider that complaint, however, that the movie was too dark and disturbing for children, because it's not just a criticism that helped to tank the box office for Raggedy Ann and Andy, A Musical Adventure. It's also one that turns up time and time again in any critique of children's entertainment, whether it's Hocus Pocus, Labyrinth, Return to Oz, the Last Unicorn, The Watcher in the Woods, The Black Cauldron, Fern Gully, The Last Rainforest, The Neverending Story, The Secret of Nim, All Dogs Go to Heaven. Actually, the late 70s through the mid 90s were kind of a hotbed of dark and frightening children's entertainment, and critics for that entire time period, including critics addressing 1977's Raggedy Ann and Andy, were more than happy to lay the blame at the feet of the growing horror and slasher genres. How dare the critics and parents groups cried, these Hollywood filmmakers tried to cash in on the popularity of horror by terrorizing the children with violent, nightmarish fantasies. But if we look at it honestly, that wasn't a new idea at the time. The Black Cauldron was based on Lloyd Alexander's Chronicles of Prydain, which began publication as a series for young readers in 1964 and contains images such as Hordes of the Walking Dead and a prophetic vision of a broken sword weeping blood. Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim was published in 1971, and The Secret of Nim's dark, twisted vision of animal experimentation is almost a perfect reflection of the novel's original tone. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was originally published in 1964, and the only thing that keeps it from being a harrowing tale of a multiple child murderer being allowed to roam free is the intervention of Roald Dahl's editors. All of those titles, of course, still go back to the 1960s, not that far from the era we were talking about. But in 1901, Charles and Mary Lamb published Tales from Shakespeare, a storybook that edited Shakespeare's plays into what were then considered child-friendly bedtime tales. 
You might think that the Lambs would have focused on Shakespeare's comedies, perhaps editing out the dirtier jokes, but among the plays they chose, you'll find The Winter's Tale, Cymbeline, King Lear, Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, and Othello. Tales of political intrigue, treachery, murder, and suicide, which the Lambs categorized in their preface as enrichers of the fancy, strengtheners of virtue, and a lesson of all sweet and honorable thoughts and actions to teach courtesy, benignity, generosity, humanity. And one example that is so commonly posed that it almost goes without saying, but if I leave it out, my comments will be full of people wanting to know why, Grimm's Fairy Tales, originally published in 1812. While the brothers Grimm published their work as a volume of children's stories, critics even then complained that the tales were too dark and distressing for younger audiences. In fact, the brothers had recorded stories from an extended history of oral tradition, and the versions they published were already significantly edited to remove sexual references. But violence, the Grimm's felt, was not a topic to avoid around children. But you shouldn't be sad. We'll be your friends. Uh-huh. You will? For sure. And maybe things will get better. Well, that's why I keep a-chasing them other camels. All happy and a-dancing, smiling and a-singing, calling me home. But while older audience members like to complain about children's entertainment being too dark, the stories they criticize often go on to become cult successes later, because those children who experience it the first time around find value in a story that doesn't treat them as in need of protection from ideas. Those children take hold of the story that treated them like thinking, feeling people who could learn to withstand distress, and they want those stories repeated. They then go on to share it with other children who didn't get to see it the first time, and as they grow to adulthood, these stories become a key part in the narrative of how they became the adult that they are, and many of them then seek to pass those stories along to their own children. Raggedy Ann and Andy, A Musical Adventure, however, is such a movie that has only had a very narrow window to find a cult audience. After underperforming at the box office, 20th Century Fox would do very little to distribute the film in secondary markets. It would play briefly in rotation on Showtime in 1978 and air once on CBS before being released on CED video disc and VHS. The closest it would get to widespread attention would come in the late 1980s, when the Disney Channel would put it into rotation for a few years, and the early 90s, when Nickelodeon would air it as part of their children's movie programming block, Special Delivery. But since that time, the movie has largely dropped out of sight. Plagued by legal issues over who owns what rights for the film, it has yet to be released officially on Laserdisc, DVD, Blu-ray, or digital making it nearly impossible for the film to find a new audience. It is kept alive largely by extra-legal uploads and pirated copies, including several digital copies that populate torrent sites, which were scanned directly from 35mm prints. And also, it is kept alive by two stage adaptations, 1981's Raggedy Ann and Andy, adapted for school and community theaters by original writer Patricia Thackray, and 1984's Rag Dolly, also titled simply Raggedy Ann, which was an even darker treatment of the material, written by the miracle worker playwright William Gibson, with mostly new songs by Joe Raposo. That show would make it to Broadway only briefly in 1986, where the critics would roast it as being inappropriate for children. But in the modern era, that adaptation has captured the imagination of young Broadway fans, who have started an online movement to see the show revived. So what dark and twisted story did you experience as a child that helped shape you into who you are today? I'm team The Last Unicorn myself. But drop down into the comments below and let me know, 
And if you've watched this far into the video, try to work the word camel into your comment somewhere as our secret sign that we're all in the cool kids club together. Until next time, watch like it means something.